Howdy guys, Jimmy Song here. Welcome to another episode of Bitcoin Tech Talk, issue number 134. I can't believe it's been that many issues. Anyway, uh, it's good to be back here on Monday. Um, as usual, I, I, I put out the newsletter every week and this is the show where we go over all of the stories and talk about, you know, what, uh, what, some of the things that have happened uh, on a technical basis um, in Bitcoin, Lightning, and maybe some other stuff. Anyway, uh, that that's what this show is all about, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, as usual, if you do have questions, you can po post it in chat, and I will attempt to answer them if you if you have anything. All right, so let's get started by sharing my screen. Uh, and we will get to this uh, uh, this week's newsletter. Um, if you haven't subscribed to this newsletter, you can do so using the link in the show notes. Um, I also have a bunch of other stuff on there, like, for example, a link to my book. Um, I now have 18 reviews. Um, the price is holding steady at $40.59. I don't know, it's somehow like, the lower it drops, the higher Bitcoin price seems to go. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that Amazon keeps dropping the price. Anyway, um, yeah, it was at one point something like $58 and then it dropped to 40, uh, 50 and then 48 and now it's like 40. So yeah, anyway, that's, uh, that's my book. Uh, if you're interested in learning how to program uh, Bitcoin in, and learn it all in Python, this is the book for you. Um, the other thing is uh, programming blockchain. This is my two-day seminar. The only one I have scheduled right now is in New York City right after consensus, May 16th and 17th. Um, yeah, uh, you'll you'll get a copy of my book as part of part of the uh, seminar. And you know, I, I, I think uh, the price goes up in like three more days. So um, yeah, if you're interested in this, please apply now and I will get back to you as quickly as I can. All right, so let's take a look at some of the stories. Here is, um, <clears throat> here is an interesting one. Uh, how to explain Bitcoin to your friends and family. Now, we've all had to deal with this, right? Like uh, a lot of people are like, what, what is Bitcoin? Can you, can you explain it to me in like five minutes? Explain, explain it like I'm five. Well, this is a, it, it isn't exactly like your five, but it, it does explain a lot. And, uh, and this, this story actually got picked up by Zero Hedge. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty good uh, way to look at it, at, at least from sort of like the perma bear uh, libertarian perspective that Zero Hedge tends to be. Um, but yeah, you, you, you could take a look at what is, uh, you know, like at, at this article and sort of glean how it might make sense to somebody that doesn't necessarily know what Bitcoin is. Um, I have another article that I'll include in next week's. I, I didn't quite uh, learn about it until this morning. Uh, that That's similar in that regard. Um, it, it is very important to be able to explain things clearly. Uh, that's a, uh, uh, and you know, who knows, maybe you'll, you'll gain some insight from uh, the explanation in this article. All right, uh, this is an article by Kyle Torpy. Uh, he wrote he wrote for Coin Journal. Will Schnorr and Taproot be as difficult for Bitcoin to activate as Segwit? And this is an excellent, excellent question, uh, because as uh, as we all know, um, you know, Segwit took a long time to activate. Um, I think the first. Uh, you know, uh, difficulty adjustment period that I could have gotten into was in like December of 2016. It didn't actually activate until August of 2017. So there was about eight months in there of a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, like jockeying back and forth, a lot of arguing, uh, a lot of name calling. Um, I actually came into my own as a blogger right around then because uh, I, I was, com there was a lot to comment about, right? Like, UASF, uh, Shaolin Fry, and Litecoin doing its own thing, and Bitcoin Cash, and all that stuff. That 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 happened all during that time. So Kyle's asking this uh, this question. Well, you know, there's there are all these things that are probably all going to get into the next uh, soft fork, which is Shinor signatures, Taproot, Sighash, no input. Um, that might be Opmask or something like that. Um, you know what? What's going to happen? What What's the mechanism that we're going to use to uh, activate that soft fork? Um, and uh, and uh, Segwit was done using BIP nine, uh, and that required 
95% of minor, uh, minor signaling readiness in blocks before it would fully activate. Um, but if it didn't do so in a year, then it would just um, not activate it at all. Uh, BIP8 is almost exactly the same, except the default is that instead of not activating, it'll activate anyway after a year. Um, and that's because, you know, it's, it's the right of any, any node to, um, you know, like, uh, put in transactions that are still legal. And that's that's essentially what uh, Segwit version one would be. Um, anyway, it's, uh, you know, the the big points there are the it, it definitely is less political today. And um, a lot of the people that opposed uh, that uh, soft work uh, went over to Bitcoin Cash and then they split again to Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin ABC and Bitcoin SV and so on. So, um, some people are optimistic because a lot of those people left. Other people are not because, you know, I mean, it, it just might be the nature of softworks that it does kind of get contentious. Um, but, you know, who knows? We, we're, we're, but it's a great question to ask and something really important to think about um, as we come upon a Segway version one, which I think is going to just be called Taproot from what I hear. All right, um, this is another story. Uh, well, this one's about the Lightning Network, the inbound capacity problem. Florencia Ravena um, uh, actually has a really, really good article on what, what this inbound capacity problem is. Um, generally, if you have, uh, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to establish an outbound connection. So if you're connecting to another node, and you have some Bitcoin that you want to spend, that's easy enough. Um, and you know, uh, you're know you continuously paying to that other node and through that other node to other nodes uh, for goods and services and so on. Um, the problem comes in uh, because it's, it's almost entirely unidirectional, right, um, in that case. And you once you run out, it's kind of like a debit card that you've exhausted. What, what do you do with it? Well, um, well, you're going to have to open up another channel. Um, and, you know, I mean, it is more efficient than having 10 transactions on chain, uh, but it's not ideal because uh, you don't you don't have the opportunity to rebalance. What you actually need is some other node to open up a channel to you and get some inbound capacity. That is the ability for other people to pay to you. The thing about inbound capacity, though, is that it locks up the Bitcoin. So somebody has to be willing to sort of lock up Bitcoins so uh, for payment to you. And that that's kind of a little bit of a social problem because like, uh, you know, most people don't have a reputation. So when they're, when they're trying to create a um, uh, lightning channel, they, they want to connect to kind of known nodes and not, you know, nodes that they don't know anything about. And, um, and so they, it, it goes through all of the different uh, explanations of that in this article, a uh, very good article. Um, I would encourage you to read more about it here and uh, great diagrams and so on. All right, Moon, this is, uh, this is a Chrome extension that lets you uh, shop online with cryptocurrency. Um, and mostly it's uh, the big one is Amazon. You can shop with Lightning on Amazon. So uh, the only thing about this that's a little different is that, uh, you know, say, say then purse is that pay, purse lets you get like a discount off of the Amazon price. This one, um, they take like 1% of the credit card fees or something to that effect. And they, they do the actual transaction with Amazon. So, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's nice that you can use, uh, you know, lightning, but like economically, it makes more sense to go use purse or something like that because you're going to get a better discount. But that said, if you want to sort of test out the lightning network, that's a great way to do it. All right. And here's another one, uh, another lightning story. This is uh, from Lightning Labs. If you are not aware, this is uh, Elizabeth uh, Stark is the CEO of Lightning Labs and uh, a bunch of really good developers there that are working on some really cool stuff. Um, but this is a the Lightning Desktop app, and this is essentially a Lightning wallet um, that that uses Neutrino. Um, and if you're not familiar, Neutrino is a replacement for Bit37, which allows for light clients um, and without ha having to run a full node. Um, you do need uh, to sync all of the blocks and uh, get a lot of the filters and so on. Um, but it's uh, it, it's it's a really good idea, and you know I, I, it's it's now live on mainnet, so you can actually fund your lightning channels 
uh, with the Lightning Desktop app and so on. Uh, so you know, I, I encourage you to try it. You can uh, you can download using their GitHub. I think it's the first link in the article, zero point five alpha. Um, so now it's live on mainnet. You can you can actually like pay for things and so on. All right, uh, this uh, a stake to the heart. This is uh, an article by Ben Davenport on proof of stake and why it's uh, doesn't. It, it's actually kind of bad, right? Like, uh, and and the whole idea of proof of stake here um, can be really terrible, especially with tax implications. If you uh, and he goes through, you know, various scenarios of what happens if uh, you know, like, what how much the IRS, at least in the U.S., how much. Uh, they were collecting taxes for proof of stake income and so on. Um, and, you know, just the brokenness of proof of stake in the first place, because the, the quantity changes, but your percentage holdings go down unless you're staking. Uh, so, you know, I, it goes through that. And obviously you have tax liability and so on. Um, in many ways, you, you end up losing a lot of money because uh, proof of stake ends up uh, basically, uh, you know, putting you on the hook for a lot of liability uh, tax wise um, on top of, you know, like if, if you measure your wealth in terms of the proportion of that cryptocurrency that you happen to own. So, um, yeah, I, really interesting article. And I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, one, one of the things he says is, you know, even uh, like depending on the staking yield, um, the government gets more and more of a portion of that, coin very very quickly and at a certain point you can do all sorts of attacks if you if you have uh over 50 percent of the stake and all they have to do is sit on the currency right like or or something to that effect um but i mean if it if the government doesn't accept that cryptocurrency then there's obviously a lot of selling pressure every time that there's uh, tax liabilities due and so on so it's kind of like a ticking time bomb and i i think that's kind of the point um it's a, it's not a very good idea all right, um, scriptless scripts. This is from Jordan Clifford, um, and this is uh, you know, uh, scriptless scripts are this idea that you can have a lot of the smart uh, contract programming capability that smart contract languages like Script have uh, without the actual language uh, using various um, little interesting, clever uh, ways of doing things, um, and uh, the. This goes on and talks about uh, you know what what they are and how they work. Uh, very good uh, overview. Uh, right now they're used, I think, mostly in Mimblewimble. Uh, but uh, if you're if you've been curious about this, this is something that you should definitely take a look at. And the final story is Zandi's story, and this is apparently um, you know a document that got leaked, but it's a it's like a. It was uh, published, uh, I guess uh, it's from earlier this month, but it, it got leaked out onto Scribd um, I, like in the last week or two. Uh, but basically the Maker Foundation is having some serious problems. And, uh, you know, like, yeah, I mean, you, you can read all of it. But uh, there, there's a, there's, this is kind of what happens when like a central entity controls a lot of coins. There's going to be people that fight over it. So... Um, you can you can go read all of it, or you can just uh, it says skip to page twenty two, and we can do that here. There's a very clear way of asking the main question being argued back and forth here: Is this foundation legitimate? Yeah, good question. And uh, you know, if you were the you were a government that wanted to control MakerDAO, what would you do? Yeah, you would regulate this central entity, wouldn't you? Uh, just just asking the question. Okay. Anyway, that's uh, that. That's it. Uh, let me just uh, show my book again. This is on Amazon Programming Bitcoin. Learn how to book, program Bitcoin from scratch. It's available on paper book, paperback, and Kindle. Um, you know, there's a lot of diagrams and stuff, so I would recommend the paperback. Um, and you know, you can email me if you if if you if you don't like it or something like that, and I'll I'll try to help you out. Uh, programming blockchain again in New York City, uh, May 16th and 17th, uh, two day seminar. If you want to become a programmer, all right. Uh, in Bitcoin. All right, so that's about it for the stories. Let's take a look at some of the questions. There's a uh, What's the minimum requirement to fully understand your book? Only Python, and what especially is learnable about programming Bitcoin in your book? Well, uh, the the main 
thing that you need to know is how to program uh, in Python. And once you know that and uh, you know learn maybe a couple of uh, slightly more advanced things in Python, like um, uh, you know list comprehensions and subclassing and things like that, um, you should be able to uh, learn all of it. Um, the the big thing uh, that I, I designed that book around and my course around is uh, making it approachable from somebody that doesn't know anything about Bitcoin. I, I've had many people like that take my class. And um, I, I start with the math for that reason. And by starting with the math, it's something that everyone needs to know. Uh, not everyone knows about finite fields or elliptic curves. Uh, so by teaching those things first and coding those in Python, it, it helps to establish the uh, a base and um, and you know eventually I get into transactions and deconstructing them and um, you know going through what all of it does and so on uh, and you know blocks and you know what a blockchain is and all that. Uh, I, I've been told that it's a very approachable book, uh, especially if you know Python, and that's how I've designed it. That's what all my reviewers said. That's what a lot of reviews on uh, on Amazon say. Um, so hopefully that helps you if you're interested. You know, I mean, it's it's open source too, so you can go on my GitHub and uh, re read a little bit if you want a preview or whatever. Um, all right. Electrum, man in the middle, attack fixed yet? When fixed? Um, you'd have to ask the Electrum developers. I, I, I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, I, I, I haven't been keeping up because I don't use Electrum as a wallet. Anyway, uh, that's about it for the questions. Uh, it's always good to uh, be with you guys during, um, during this. Uh, hopefully um, that helped you. Uh, and this song is done.